Tom, uh, 7806 Whiskey is at Adi Azi Aviation Ramp, holding short of taxiway Bravo. It's hard to understand. It's hard to believe that it's just not a dream. He's gone and we can't get him back. But now he's gone. He's gone. What about his parents and his family and his friends? The pain that you will never remember is the pain that they will never forget. 7806 Whiskey uh, requesting departure to the west. On a Tuesday afternoon, Adrian Valentine called and requested to taxi his small aircraft. He was just 21 and a very new pilot, but the weather was not good. In the control tower, they told him. But if you stand by a minute, we will be VFR. I think it's updating now to uh, be not IFR, showing now few at 800. So if you stand by a minute or two, we'll be uh, VFR. I think that gave Adrian some hope. But what was about to happen next was beyond anyone's worst nightmare. This is the story of the fatal plane crash of young Adrian Valentine and those that were a part of his final moments on this earth. What I want you to remember is think about the people that loved Adrian. And you know there's people out there that love you. I don't want you out doing that stuff. Here's, here's what, that's, uh, you might call it a tough love. But we're not, we're not doing that. You were Scott Fryer. This is a, a bigger story, the story of Adrian and his decisions that he made. So um, I'd like to just ask you what your background is, how you knew Adrian, and, uh, and let you talk about it. Well, um, I've been a private pilot for approximately 43 years. Um, I'll be 62 in December. The go, no-go decision is, is very important in your school. Uh, is ingraining uh, that same concept. I think this uh, this conversation is one that needs to be had um, across America, and I appreciate you assuming a leadership role and being willing to talk to me on camera about the decisions that were made that day. So put me back in flight. You were coming in from where in the Phenom? Uh, we were coming in from Des Moines to Florida, to Melbourne, Florida, and we overheard uh, an aircraft requesting help on 121.5. Uh, we couldn't hear the aircraft, but we heard the responses from the airliners that were over top of that aircraft, and the airliners were describing it as a, uh inadvertent IMC. It's funny. He was, we were right on top of him at the time. He said so. But, but if you looked at four flight, but he had the green line. He was just going in circles, like his arrow kept doing this. Mm -hmm. And then another guy jumped on and said, um, Get your foot off the rudder, like another pilot. And then the the, oh, wow. the the ATC, the controller said, "Everyone clear, like don't do that." Right? But then he said, the controller said, and then he would everything would be calm, and he would say, "I think I'm descending. I'm descending. I'm descending." Put put others back in your seat. You're helpless in your jet listening obviously this young man is in trouble and he's desperate what did those radio transmissions sound like to you uh they were quite terrifying 
I called him Sunday morning and I said, listen, the weather here at our airport is IMC. It's complete overcast. The ceiling is at uh, 600 feet. I said, you cannot get in here. And, and for your viewers out there, I mean, he's got 80 hours. Remember, he hasn't done his commercial or his instrument. Right. He's had the three hours. Very, the very green. Yeah. Yeah. That we're all required. And he's probably forgotten more than he learned on that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I called him, he says, I can't hear, you know, I can't hear you. He texted back. I can't hear you. Please text me your message. So I said, I want to make sure you're not leaving today. I said, we're IMC here. Gainesville's IMC. Mm -hmm. All the Jacksonville airports. Everybody's IMC. You cannot make it up here. Don't fly the airplane. Right. And he says, okay. Right. And this is, you tried to call him Sunday. This was on Sunday. And you, and you sent him a text because he was at the concert. Couldn't hear you. Couldn't hear so me. So you texted that to him. Uh, and that's probably before he lost his phone. Correct. Correct. So I think so. Sometime after that time, that afternoon, that evening. Yeah, his he, phone he was his either phone. lost or stolen. Right. Um, I don't really know which. This is coming from his parents. Okay. And so this was another thing that became a distraction. We know that phones are not cheap now. This is a thousand dollar phone he's lost. Yep. And apparently the phone carrier, and I'm not gonna mention any names, but right. they would not let him get another phone without paying off the other. Right. So the money he had with him, whether he had his debit card or whatever, right. guess where it's taking money away from? It's taking away money from my flying. Yep. Now I've got to save that money somewhere else, don't I? Sure. Well, you really didn't have to. Yeah. And you every, just had every to go time back you... to work here or somewhere. But, yeah, exactly. But in his mind, I really believe he thought, this is taking me away from my goal. I need to yeah. go towards yeah. my goal. Every time you swipe that card, it just hurts exactly. a little bit. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So he had to get the phone, and thank you for reminding me of that. Yep. So that, that probably was a distraction, and that was a huge financial distraction. Right. And so I didn't know this at the time that this had occurred. Uh -huh. He just communicated with me. Right. I only found this out after the accident from his parents okay. about the loss of the phone. Okay, gotcha. So that was Sunday. So I didn't hear anything from him on Monday. And I thought, well, I did have the conversation. And he knows I took the time to reach out to him. Yep. He's heeding my warning. He's checking the weather. Yep. And he knows he can't get back here. Yep. So... Uh, didn't hear anything from him all day, and obviously I was in and out here at our airport, and the airplane hadn't returned, and I knew he couldn't get in here anyway, not safely. Right, right. It was shocking. Um, you could hear the stress in the young man's voice. You could hear that uh, he wasn't prepared for the situation that he had entered, um, and he wasn't sure how to get out, and he wasn't sure that he was going to get out of the situation. And he would be calm and then he would start yelling, oh my God. And, and so the air traffic guy said, okay, I want you to level the yoke against the panel. Just level it off. I don't want you to push it forward or backward. And then he said, I want you to, do you have a magnetic compass? Yes. I want you to look at the compass. Now turn the yoke slightly to the left until it moves two degrees. Okay. And he, say, he says, okay, okay. And then, the, then the, air, the controller said, okay, great. Now level it off. He said, now I want you to turn it to the right until it moves two degrees. And he kind of got through that. And I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, okay. Because he's saying, all, like every time he'd ask him about an instrument, he would say it's down, no matter what it was. And he asked him, do you have a pedo heat? Right, mm -hmm. ask him to turn that on. Yes, yes, it's not. And I said, hey, if he can get this guy just to turn the compass, because we're flying the same to Gainesville, maybe he can get him over Gainesville. And if he sees the airport, he'll be cool. And I came back out on the porch, and I'm standing there talking to a couple of guys, and my phone rings, and it was Adrian. This is Tuesday morning of around 10 o'clock. <laughs> And in that conversation, he asked me, did you get the picture I just sent you in the text? And I said, no, let me look. Right. And so I looked at it, and he had water in the uh, collection bowl of the sampler. Right. Probably a half inch of water. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I see it now. I said, that's those gaskets. Did you get the gaskets replaced? No, sir, I didn't. So, yeah, it was a 
I think, a crazy decision. The article, the second article that I read, where he was talking, you know, they were literally, he was sitting there holding, waiting for a VFR at the destination. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's not worth it. No. You could tell that some of the crews were trying to help him out when Center wasn't there, which they were doing a great job trying to help him out. They were trying to give him words of encouragement uh, to keep him going throughout the whole thing. Hey, calm. you got to take a deep breath and calm down. Just look at your instruments and take a deep breath and calm down. Do not panic. And we make questionable decisions as humans, you know, that's kind we of, do. that's what we do. We do. Um, doesn't, doesn't make, doesn't make you a bad person or anything like that. And, uh, I think Adrian was one of those really good people. He and really was. I wish I could have met him. Um, you know, I wish I didn't have to meet you, but yeah, I've enjoyed it. But, no, 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 uh, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, you know, it was great. Not under the circumstances. Exactly. Exactly. It would have been another day, another time, but. Yeah. But there's so many. Kids and students just like Adrian flying out there, um, building hours, trying to get to that magic 1500 number uh, or 300 for commercial um, that are living, you know, seeing the same weather that Adrian saw, that are thinking about those same decisions. Um, You're pushing the limits. Still pushing the limits. Um, and, you know, I think you and, and the family and everybody that knows Adrian but would at least like to use his story as a lesson for other students to learn from. Um, so I hope that, you know, we can, we can do that and, and share what, what his experience was and encourage people to make better decisions. Yeah. You could hear, uh, in the last moments, the engine was fully revved up. Uh, you heard a cracking noise as he was keying the mic and a sound of wind rushing into the cabin. So, uh, the definitely, it, it sounded like it suffered an in-flight breakup. Completely terrifying. Uh, I just, uh, even from a, a fourth person perspective now this far away from it even just hearing you tell about it from from the cockpit of a jet over it's still uh amazing and the one thing that i go back to here is the thing that the other uh, pilots have have talked about he kept on talking about the fact that his instruments were not working yes he kept repeating over and over again that none of his instruments were working which as a CFI or as a professional pilot, you know that you have all these different systems that work in conjunction to ensure you know, that there's safety, that you have an electrical system, you have a vacuum system, you have a pedostatic system, and it's not really likely that all those systems would ever go out all at the same time. So what that tells me as an instructor is that the person who's looking at the panel doesn't know what they're looking at, can't read the indications that the panel is giving them. Now, we know that this is an older aircraft. We know that it's had an older style panel, not as good as a, as a standardized stick, six pack. Um, so uh, he was probably very confused at that time and unable to recover because he wasn't able to get any one of those gauges to line up right with what he thought he was feeling. Exactly. And, uh, you know, there's that old standard IFR instrument written test question that's always in there concerning should you trust your instruments and i think most likely his main problem was that he was not trusting what he was seeing from his perspective it appeared that every one of those instruments was whacked up when most likely the truth was it was his perception of what he was seeing that's what i took from the situation yes uh completely completely horrible you know they had the funeral uh, today, uh, he's got a mom and a dad and a sister. Um, I'm I'm hoping, Derek, that uh, our short talk here, uh, you were there, you heard it. You're one of about eight pilots uh, I've, I've talked to. Well, it was an unfortunate event. You know, when someone is lost in an aircraft accident, it, it greatly affects people. I don't mind talking about it for the simple reason that we can get the word out there to stop this from ever happening again. We are going to have a meeting the first week of December at the school. We're going to talk to all the students about it. We're going to have a conversation about ADM. We're going to have a conversation about trusting your instruments, your controller, getting the training that you need, and then you know making sure that you're ready for the mission that you're doing, making sure that you're doing a, a flight risk analysis tool before you go or having personal minimums, something to rely on that you can check against what's happening and say, we shouldn't fly today. Perfect. Uh, I, I I couldn't have said it better. And uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time and the risk to go on camera. There's going to be several people 
around the world watch this interview and know that Derek from MLB in Florida, the flight school, went on camera with an opinion. But I, I value your opinion, and I think other people will too. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate what you do. So anyway, I was a little stern with him there, and about that time his dad pulled up, and uh, I let him know that wasn't a very smart thing to do even in front of his father. Mm -hmm. But again, good kid. You could tell he knew he had let me down, I think. I felt he had uh, some remorse there, mm. but did it change him? I don't know, evidently not. Right. He, uh, he had some level of determination, and you're right, it's called get there itis. He was trying to get there or get here that day, mm -hmm. and when he went to Kissimmee Airport, he was trying to get back here. Right. There towards the very end, you know, Adrian's overall makeup i've learned here in the last couple of days he he was very energetic up to a point and then he he kind of his energy curve fell off at the very end do you do you think or did you sense at the very very end almost a sense of hopelessness and the fact that he that he actually just gave up yeah he absolutely uh started to give up you could hear that he was frustrated and tired with the situation, although he was able to keep the aircraft aloft, he definitely was never able to gain full control of the aircraft during the whole event. Uh, some people were trying to give him words of encouragement to try to keep him going, but uh, he wasn't. I don't think he had the capacity at the time based on the workload to receive those words of encouragement, unfortunately. I think at the very end, he he did give up, and he he made several transmissions regarding his parents. And what what are those that you overheard? Uh, he kept asking repeatedly for Center to uh, tell his parents that he loved them, and those were his final words as he was going down uh, in the last moments. What I want you to remember is think about the people that loved Adrian. And you know there's people out there that love you. But sometimes it has to be a tough love. Sometimes somebody has to say it, so I will. If you've never been in the clouds before, you will die your first time in the clouds much the same way. In ATC, they tried, but they made some errors. You can't level a plane in the clouds by leveling the yoke. And you can't expect a young panicked pilot to fly off the whiskey compass in the clouds. The truth is that the gauges were all working. ATC just didn't realize that. The only words that young Adrian needed to hear were to trust the gauges, focus on that attitude indicator, get wings level, believe that attitude indicator, it is not messed up. Trust it. Get wings level. Do not look outside. Do not look away from that panel. This, this is love. Tough love.